Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to Privacy Rights in Canada, a panel discussion on privacy rights and freedom of expression today in classrooms, at the border, and in police searches. The BC Civil Liberties Association graciously acknowledges the support of the Canadian Internet Registration Authority and the Law Foundation of Ontario for making tonight's event possible. Tonight's presentation is part of a larger educational project supported by a grant from CIRA's Community Investment Program, while also financially supported in part by the Law Foundation of Ontario the BCCLA is solely responsible for all of tonight's content. My name is Catherine Benson. I'm a summer law student at the BCCLA, and it's my pleasure to moderate tonight's panel with BCCLA lawyers, Megan McDermott and Mara Salanders, as well as special guests, Spencer Eisen and Jessica Kim, who are the editor chief and the managing editor of the Griffin's Nest student newspaper. Before we begin our event, I would like to acknowledge that the BCCLA is based on the stolen and unceded Coast Salish territories on the shared lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. As we're all joining virtually, I recognize that some members may be joining from many different territories this evening. So I invite you to take a moment to share which lands you are joining from in the chat now. As this event addresses privacy in Canada, we at the BCCLA feel that it's important to note the ways in which the right to privacy is heavily impacted by colonization. Government surveillance of Indigenous land defenders is consistently used as a tool to repress their resistance. This can be seen in the surveillance of the tiny house warriors and the Indigenous land defenders who are currently being subjected to an escalating regime of surveillance and intimidation for their opposition to the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and its associated work camps. Ultimately, their surveillance and resulting repression of Indigenous peoples restricts their right to defend both themselves and their land, and is an example of one of the many tools of the ongoing colonial project that is the Canadian state. We've provided some links in the chat if you'd like to read more about these issues. We have provided captioning and ASL interpretation for this evening. But if you require a transcript of the event, please reach out to info at bccla.org. Throughout tonight's event, I would invite you to share your questions or thoughts about tonight's topic in YouTube's live stream chat function. However, we ask that you maintain a respectful environment and any hateful language, disrespectful dialogue or abusive forum will not be tolerated. We've tried our best to have this evening run as smoothly as possible and as accessibly as possible, but please forgive me if we run into any issues in this virtual world. We'll try to resolve them as quickly as we can. I'd now like to move on to some brief opening remarks. For 60 years, the BCCLA has been fighting for equality, liberty, freedom, and justice. The BCCLA is the oldest and longest running civil liberties association in Canada. And we accomplish our work through public education, law and policy reform, and litigation. Our work includes a range of civil liberties and human rights issues, such as police accountability, prisons and criminalization, Indigenous rights, national security and surveillance, migrant rights, Haitian rights, democratic rights, and equality rights. Privacy and freedom of expression have been core parts of the BCCLA's work for decades. Both of these charter protected rights are essential in order for us to be able to participate in a free and democratic society. Tonight, we'll be talking about how these rights intersect with many people's day-to-day -day lives, and especially how these rights are engaged by youth in our schools and by anyone who's crossing our border. Many of these topics, of course, overlap with other issues of civil liberties, and we hope that this evening begins to eliminate some of the ways in which privacy rights are tied to other social justice issues. Before we begin with our speakers, we're excited to premiere a new animated video, which looks at the rights of youth and their smartphones in Canadian classrooms. The privacy rights of our youth is a topic that we feel is often overlooked, and we're excited to premiere this never before seen two minute educational video. This video was produced by Hot Neon and is the result of new research conducted by the BCCLA and supported by CIRA and the Law Foundation of Ontario. 
We hope that you will enjoy our new creation and that this video provides you with some context for our speakers. Did you know that in Canada, school administrators may be legally authorized to search their students' electronic devices, including cell phones, through their code of conduct? That means your high school principal has the right to confiscate your device if they think the necessary factors have been met. You might be thinking, I keep a lot of important personal information on my phone. Aren't people expected to have a reasonable amount of security and privacy in this country? Well, you're right. Sort of. In Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it states that everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure. But the Charter also allows those rights to be limited within reason. This means a high school principal has even more authority over searching students than a police officer. In this case, the Supreme Court of Canada decided teachers and principals must be able to react quickly to problems at school, to protect their students, and provide an orderly atmosphere for learning. In fact, the School Act, a law that sets out the legal powers and responsibilities of teachers, school administrators, and school boards, operates in part by virtue of in loco parentis, meaning people working in school act as parents and guardians. So what does that mean for you? School administrators can confiscate and search your electronic devices if they feel their code of conduct has been violated. And because this hasn't been challenged in court, we really don't know how far state powers extend within our school systems. So what can you do to keep your phone safe at school? Look into your school's code of conduct. And if it's unclear, talk to your school about drafting a technology use policy. But most importantly, keep your phone in a secure and safe place. Educate yourself on privacy rights and what you can do to keep your e-devices safe on the BC Civil Liberties website at bccla.org slash e-devices. Thank you so much to everyone who works to create that great video. I'd like now to introduce our first speaker, Marissa Landers, who conducted the research for the BCCLA that was instrumental in creating the video that you just watched. Mara will be diving deeper into the topic of youth's vulnerability to searches on their smartphones and other electronic devices in Canadian schools. Over to you, Mara. Thanks, Catherine. So when students go to school today, they carry around a wealth of private information in their pockets. Teachers and other school administrators are also facing an increased pressure to keep students safe. But does this mean that they should have unrestricted access to a student's electronic devices? Let's explore the law around privacy and electronic devices for students while in school. So as you heard in the video, section eight of the charter states that everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. The purpose of this section is to protect a reasonable expectation of privacy. A reasonable expectation of privacy is highly contextual, which allows the court to be flexible and in theory, able to adapt to change, changes in the privacy environment. It also means that someone doesn't have the same expectation of privacy in every single context. For example, as we're going to discuss today, students have a lower expectation of privacy in school than they do at home. And this is because school administrators have a responsibility to provide a safe environment and maintain order and discipline in the school. So the privacy rights of students are limited in order to protect the rights of all students to be safe and secure while they go to school. A student's right to privacy to date has largely been shaped by what we call the common law, which refers to the way that court decisions shape our laws by interpreting them and then filling in the gaps where they need to. Decisions made by the Supreme Court of Canada establish the law on specific issues and they apply to the entire country. And there are two key decisions that have established the rules around searching students. We will talk about these decisions shortly. Student privacy rights are also established in British Columbia, for example, via a law called the School Act and in Ontario via the Education Act. These are laws that set out the legal powers and responsibilities of teachers, school administrators and school boards. The School Act in BC requires that students comply with school rules, the code of conduct, and any other rules and policies that are established by that school board. The codes of conduct are guidelines that are published by school districts and individual schools that help administrators to make decisions about various aspects of school life. 
some BC codes of conduct actually authorize personal electronic device searches. For example, the Vancouver School Board Code of Conduct states that a principal may conduct or authorize a search of a student or personal property, including backpacks and personal electronic devices, including computers and cell phones, or a locker, if they feel there are reasonable grounds to believe that school procedures have been or are being violated, and that evidence of the violation may be found in the location or on the device or person, person of the student searched. So where codes of conduct speak to rules about search and seizure of school proper, of school, student and school property, like the piece I just read from the Vancouver School Board, the language tends to be based on, based on those court decisions that I just mentioned. The ones that have established the rules around the lawful searches of students while at school. However, it is critical to note that the Supreme Court of Canada has outlined the necessary factors to be met in order for a student search to be permissible. But the specific context of a personal device search has yet to be challenged in court. So there is actually no definitive answer, despite what certain schools and districts have stated in their codes of conduct. Schools are likely proceeding on these, with these searches on a case-by-case -case basis. And there's also reason to believe, given changes in the law around smartphone and electronic device searches by law enforcement, which will be discussed later on in the panel, that the court may see a reason to revisit this issue in schools, should the opportunity for a legal challenge arise. But I'm going to walk us through the case law today as it currently stands. It started in 1998 with a Supreme Court of Canada decision called RVMR, which determined that students do have an expectation of privacy at school, but at that expectation is lower given the school setting and the responsibility of school administrators to ensure the safety and well-being of, student, of the student body. As such, a student can't expect the same right to privacy that they would have in their own house while they are at school. This is because, as I said, the, res the responsibility of school administrators to provide a safe and orderly environment is considered a reasonable limit, and this refers to section one of the charter, on a student's right to privacy. I'll read you a quote from that decision. Teachers and principals must be able to react quickly and effectively to problems that arise in school, to protect their students and to provide the orderly atmosphere required for learning. Their role is such that they must have the power to search. Further, students' expectation of privacy will be lessened while they attend school or a school function. This reduced expectation of privacy, coupled with the need to protect students and provide a positive atmosphere for learning, clearly indicate that a more lenient and flexible approach should be taken to searches conducted by teachers and principals than would apply to searches conducted by the police. The judges also outlined certain factors to apply when determining whether a search of student at whether a search of student at school is reasonable. Generally, in order for a search by school officials to be reasonable, it must be authorized by the relevant provincial act, the school act, for example, in BC, and the code of conduct, and must be carried out in a sensitive and minimally intrusive manner. This means school officials are not authorized to search a student in front of the entire school body nor are they allowed to search as extensively as they want without good reason. A court will consider all surrounding circumstances of a search. The reasonable extent of the search will vary depending on the gravity of the violation suspected. For example, if a teacher suspects a student is carrying dangerous weapons, they will have the authority to expand the boundaries of the search to include the student's locker, backpack, perhaps a cell phone, because the immediate threat to general student body justifies a swift, thorough, and extensive search. But not every possible rule violation is as serious as bringing weapons to school. So the school official may not be justified in searching all of a student's property, including their cell phone, in every circumstance. So moving on 10 years later, the issue made it to the Supreme Court of Canada again in a decision called RVAM, and the judges considered what types of searches might be reasonable. They decided in RVAM that a blanket invitation from a principal to the police authorizing the use of sniffer dogs at random to search student backpacks for drugs was not reasonable. RVAM added to the previous framework established in RVMR that searches need to be based on evidence of a possible violation. They cannot be arbitrary and they cannot be done at random. 
Evidence can include a school administrator's reasonable suspicious of, suspicion of a violation, for example. And these reasonable suspicions could be a teacher seeing someone a teacher seeing someone passing a student something suspicious or a report from other reliable students that a student is carrying a knife or other weapon. In BC, there is a provincial court decision from 2014 that gives us some other examples of things that were considered to be grounds for a reasonable search. These were the smell of cannabis, a student's known history with drugs, and suspicious activity near the student's locker. So to bring it all together, we've got the charter, which protects you from unreasonable search and seizure, general, seizure generally and provides a right to privacy. This privacy right is not without limits, however, and in the school context is balanced by that responsibility of school administrators to provide a safe and orderly learning environment for all students, which authorizes those broader powers of search and seizure. Then the School Act in BC is a law that gives the legal powers and responsibilities to teachers and principal, as well as the school administrators and school boards. It is that law that also gives teachers and principals the right to search you based on that relevant code of conduct and that responsibility to pro provide a safe and orderly learning environment. The School Act also requires that the staff and students comply with any rules or codes of conduct established by the school board. Finally, we have the common law, which provides structure to these contexts and decides how the laws should be applied. At the BCCLA, we think that students have legitimate claims to privacy while they're in school and the right to be crystal clear on the circumstances in which their personal electronic devices can be searched. If you are at all unsure of the rules around searches and phone use at a school, ask a teacher or other school administrator if there is a technology use policy or a search and seizure policy that you can read. If not, as a parent, guardian, or student, hold the school board account to have one drafted. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mara, for sharing your informative research on this topic with us. Next, I'd like to introduce two very special guests that I've had the pleasure of working with recently, Spencer Eisen and Jessica Kim. Spencer and Jessica are student journalists at the Griffin's Nest, a student-led independent newspaper based out of the Eric Hamber High School in Vancouver. They've recently been featured in a number of news stories, including with the Globe and Mail, the TIE, and CBC, for the work that they've done pushing back against their high school's attempt to censor their journalistic works. On top of being journalists, Spencer and Jessica are also advocates for the rights of student journalists in Canada. They've been instrumental in drafting the proposed Student Press Freedom Act, which is a, a proposed piece of legislation in BC that if passed, would protect students' rights to freedom of expression and the press in British Columbia. You can find the links to the information about the Student Press Freedom Act campaign in the chat now. Spencer and Jessica will now speak about some of their works and their experiences about the intersection between freedom of speech and privacy in the Vancouver School District School Board. Thank you so much for the introduction, Catherine, and thank you to everyone at the BCCLA for having us. Um, the first thing I want to go over is something that we're all pretty aware of is that journalism relies on certain rights um, in order for us to practice it meaningfully. So the first one being freedom of expression, um, the ability for us to report the truth and share thought, belief and opinion, uh, the right to a free press where we can not only, uh, you know, create the final final expressive product, but but create it and seek information, um, circulate news and other intelligence in a way that's unobstructed. And then thirdly, the right to privacy. So the ability to engage in those first two rights um, with the absence of state supervision, observation, um, search or seizure, any other violations of privacy as well. Um, the first ex example I'll, I'll kind of go over based on our own experiences is when staff failed to treat our freedom of information requests with the pr privacy that they are required to have um, and, and therefore our ability to report as news media was adversely affected. So um, just to give a little context, this was fall, fall 2021, I wanna say. Um, and uh, we were reporting on the Vancouver Learning Network, which is the VSB's um, online school. And without our knowledge, uh, director of instruction came to our school and brought individuals in charge of the organization that we were investigating to answer our questions that we had asked 
uh, and the information we were seeking through FOI. Um, and and when we kind of asked, we prodded to what, how, you know, how did you know of this freedom of info information request? Um, her only response was, you know, information gets around, which was kind of a jarring, eerie response that, uh, I don't know, it was, it was strange. Um, but, but in particular, this kind of highlights the vulnerable situation that student journalists in particular face, um, as these are individuals with statutory authority over us, and, and the hierarchy in schools makes it very difficult for students to stand up for their own rights if they are aware of them. Um, and, and that meeting alone, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it's one in many, many, many um, instances of attempt, attempted censorship, was that um, there was a chilling effect imposed. And, that, and that's really coming from individuals with, you know, we've talked about the SPFA, uh, the Student Press Freedom Act. We have a breadth of experience in, in freedom of expression, in uh, privacy rights, in freedom of the press. Um, and and we were we were chilled by that by that experience and by that violation of privacy. Um, so so if if people and if students with the, as much advocacy experience as we do, um, I mean, case in point, we're here talking to you today. It's safe to assume that you know no other student would really um, feel safe in this situation and and you know be able to practice meaningful journalism. Um, and and we know that journalists, uh, professional journalists have the right to privacy and and very much so student journalists should have those same rights. So the Supreme Court uh, has has agreed that professional media enjoys rights to privacy in news gathering, specifically in cases RV National Post, RV Lassard and RV Vice. Um, and a quote from RV Vice that reads, uh, the decision that reads, the press, the press is S to be right uh, includes not only the right to transmit news and other information, but also the right to gather this information without undue interference from government. Section 2B's press and media guarantee includes protection for journalistic work product, as well as, or, as, or such as a reporter's personal notes, recording of interviews, or source contact lists. It also includes protecting communications with confidential sources, as well as those whose comments are off the record or not for attribution. And it includes protecting the journalist's documentation of his or her investigative work. These are the indispensable tools of which help the press gather, assess, and disseminate information. And we know the CAJ, the Canadian Association of Journalists, considers student journalists real journalists. Um, and there's no need to depart from these two determinations within the context of student media. Um, we've seen firsthand through our paper, and I'm sure that you'll see as well if you check out ehnewspaper.ca, um, um, that robust student press is really crucial and, and it serves, serves the community in so many ways. And, and in order for this, um, this meaningful journalism to take place, uh, privacy does need to be respected. But as we know, and as Spencer will also tell you, um, civil liberties are rarely at the forefront of a school district or school administrator's decision-making. And the VSB has, you know, continually demonstrated this to us, but most recently with the passage of two administrative procedures from the BC, um, that the BCCLA, CAJ, Student Press Law Center down in the United States, and ourselves deem restrictive of student journalism. So I'll pass uh, it off to Spencer now to talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Jessica, for that. Uh, uh, and yes, as she said, uh, I'll be talking about those policies a little bit. I just wanted to mention that I am getting over COVID-19 right now. So uh, if I cough or just need to catch my breath for a moment, uh, that's just because I'm recovering from that. Uh, so uh, like Jessica said, uh, two administrative procedures uh, were passed by the Vancouver School Board earlier this year uh, in the month of May. Uh, one of them was called extracurricular activities and the other one was called social media guidelines. Uh, and they really play off of each other uh, and do have a uh, detrimental effect on students' rights. And I'm going to go through a few, uh, few clauses from those policies and talk a bit about which one specifically the language and how it may intersect with freedom of expression and ultimately deter student media uh, from being able to practice student journalism meaningfully. Um, so one of the first points about this policy, uh, the social media guidelines policy, is that uh, prior approval to create a social media account for a student club must be obtained from a principal. 
uh, further that the acts, quote, access, creation, and content of that account is the responsibility of the teacher sponsor. Uh, and then likely one of the most concerning elements is, quote, the district reserves the right to remove any postings or content of any other nature from approved social media platforms that they consider to be inappropriate. Uh, and further, quote, communications and content on school slash district social media accounts must comply with this procedure and will be subject to monitoring by the district. And there, there is much to take issue uh, with in, the, in, the, in, in, in just those brief, brief sentences. Uh, and, and I think we'll begin with the last part about they'll be subject to monitoring. Um, in the Vancouver School District, which is the second largest school district in, in the province of British Columbia, uh, there are 18 secondary schools, uh, of which we can assume there are approximately 500 student clubs. Uh, we can further assume that 300 of those clubs have an Instagram account. Um, the communication sta uh, staff of the Vancouver School District were charged under this new procedure with monitoring 300, account uh, 300 social media accounts, approximately. There's three people in that department. And a question arises, how are three, three people going to monitor 300 separate accounts among their other duties? They can't, uh, which means in order to be com compliance with this policy, they'll have to become selective in who they decide to monitor and who, who they decide to start watching. And, and there is no guidance as to, as to really how you make that determination. Who gets watched? We know that you know, beyond ourselves, there are other student uh, newspapers, media organizations in the district. There are also activism clubs and ones, including ones that engage in environmental and indigenous advocacy. Uh, those could also become subject of monitoring by the district, uh, including uh, those of them who discuss potential civil disobedience, which does occur in schools uh, as organized through student clubs. Uh, what will the district do with the information they obtain through monitoring? Uh, those are all questions that need to be answered, just specific to that one element. Uh, but, it's, but within the context of the entire policies, there are further questions. Uh, such as what is the achievable goal of the procedure uh, and what, why do we need this and what is the historical context of these policies being enacted. Um, and the answers to those from what you know, our understanding is, are, is somewhat concerning. Um, these policies were passed um, where really there was no other need for them um, and that the only problematic student organization in the district was routinely causing public, uh, public embarrassment uh, was, was ourselves. Uh, there was one other club uh, that did make the news for a controversial reason. It was uh, called Catholic Club, conveniently in Eric Hamper Secondary, always making the news for something, uh, uh, which engaged competing interests of secularism in schools and freedom of religion. However, these administrative procedures do not make the comments on specifically uh, religion or religious clubs in schools, which is why we think they are still purely motivated by the existence of a student newspaper that engages in criticism. Um, Further, um, and specifically about uh, the extracurriculars policy, uh, the historical context of that um, is that uh, the near exact text of that policy appears uh, in a neighboring school district, the Surrey School District, which was adopted in the early 2000s. Um, and if you look uh, uh, on, on the internet for you know, Surrey School District uh, extracurriculars po policy, uh, one will stumble across a CBC article from that time period uh, discussing how the chair of the Surrey School District, or excuse me, the Surrey School Board, uh, instructed staff to bring forth that policy given the prevalence of GSA clubs uh, in their district, including uh, uh, the ability to notify parents if students were participating in GSAs. Uh, these policies were originally drafted uh, for an intolerant reason, uh, and uh, they were adopted several years later not for the same purpose, but they were decided uh, and they were brought forward uh, for a reason uh, that could, because of their vague language to, uh, to stifle a, a certain particular club. The school district denies that, but at the end of the day, what we're dealing with is where school officials are acting, uh, where they claim to be operating under the uh, authority of the school act, but not recognizing they're, realizing they're engaging with two other rights, uh, or sorry, a different law, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, specifically section 2B uh, and section eight, uh, and they're not considering those in those decisions. Uh, and the biggest takeaway from this example is that, uh, well, it, privacy is essential uh, in allowing student media uh, to continue its work. 
uh, and charter values need to guide administrators' decision making in addition to their statutory authority. Thank you. Thank you so much for your insights, but um, Spencer and Jessica. It's been wonderful to work with you both. Um, Spencer and Jessica are both wonderful activists and wonderful journalists, and the BCCLA is behind you both in every step on your way to fight for student press freedom in BC. Um, in addition to checking out the Student Press Freedom Act campaign, we also highly encourage you to read their excellent journalism, um, like Jessica plugged, and we're going to put the link in the chat now in case you'd like to read about their work, which I highly recommend. Um, also, Spencer, I hope you feel better soon after recovering from COVID. So we've heard tonight about searches of electronic devices and the censorship that's occurring in Canadian classrooms. And I'd like now to turn over the virtual stage back to Mara, who will pivot our conversation to look at the laws that governs police authority to search our cell phones without a warrant. Thanks, Catherine. So I'm going to pick up a little bit where I left off and say that while teachers and principals may have certain rights and responsibilities that do override student privacy interests at present, police critically do not share those. The threshold for searching youth and anyone is much higher for the police, both in school and out, due to the liberty interests that are at stake for individuals when law enforcement is involved. So generally, the police can only search you in very specific circumstances and in specific ways. They must have reasonable grounds to believe you are possibly engaged in criminal activity or have lawfully arrested you or have a warrant. The reasonable grounds required for police are much more stringent than those authorizing a principal to search a student. Things get a little bit more complicated when the teachers and police may be working together. Not all teacher, school administrator, and police searches are okay. In fact, very few of them are. The police may not use teachers to get around their own very strict search parameters, and they can't ask a teacher or other school administrator to do a search for them. In the context of our cell phones, the police can search in three instances, one, with a warrant, two, with permission from the person, and three, in the case that there's no warrant or permission, they can search as part of a, cert they can search as part of a lawful arrest. Ultimately, the police may search a phone as part of an arrest, but not in every circumstance. This common law power of the police was established by the Supreme Court of Canada in a case called R.B. Fearon from 2014. However, it's important to know about Fearon that the decision was not unanimous and the seven justices of the Supreme Court of Canada were actually split for three, so very close. Justice Karakitstanis, who was writing for the disagreeing portion, also known as the dissent, found that the police should not be able to search a phone except in extreme or exigent circumstances and that doing otherwise greatly infringes the privacy and liberty rights of individuals. She suggested the following analogy, that such a search power was actually akin to searching someone incident to arrest, finding their house key in their pocket, and then using that key to open their door and search their house without a warrant. Because of the immense volume of private and otherwise irrelevant information available in someone's phone, having the automatic power to search it would be equally as invasive as searching someone's house without a warrant. It is possible that in the future that this dissenting judgment could successfully be applied in a case as courts start to reconsider searches of personal electronic devices. However, at present, while some parties have attempted to raise the dissent in their arguments, no court has decided to start shifting the tide on this conversation. The majority of the justices in Fearon felt that under certain circumstances, the police would be justified searching a phone as part of a lawful arrest. As I said, police officers will not be authorized in every circumstances in searching a cell phone, but a search will be said to be compliant with Section 8 of the Charter if police believe the search is necessary to protect themselves from harm or that they might find evidence that will be likely to disappear before a trial. This search can include a cell phone if there is reasonable suspicion that it might contain that important evidence or a search might be necessary to protect the police the accused or the public. The searches also has to be limited to relevant parts of the phone that might contain evidence, 
So this means, for example, recently sent or drafted text, the call log or photos, for example. The police are also required to keep detailed notes of the search. So you might be wondering what happens if your phone is password protected. The majority in Fearon at the Supreme Court of Canada found that whether a phone is password protected or not, or locked or unlocked, is not ultimately relevant, as someone's decision not to password protect their phone does not indicate an abandonment of their privacy interests in the contents of their phone. In other words, phones attract the same significant level of privacy interests, whether unlocked or not. Essentially, the court found that it should not be a password standing between the police and a right to search. It should be the four fear on factors that I just mentioned that need to be fulfilled in order for the phone to be lawfully searched. And that's technically where the law stands at present. Thank you so much, Mara, for, for that and for clearly outlining when the policies, the, sorry, when the police do and do not have the abilities to search our cell phones. I'd like now to invite our final speaker, Megan McDermott, to the conversation. Megan is the policy director here at the BCCLA and will be speaking about privacy rights at our border, including the most recent bills going through the Canadian Parliament that impact these rights. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who's been speaking so far and um, let you know that my talk for the next about 10 minutes is informed largely by um, a project that was delivered in 2018 under another grant from the Canadian Internet Registry Association um, about uh, electronic devices um, and privacy at the border. Um, so some of the law and policy that I'm going to be talking about um, is now subject to some exciting changes. Um, and also uh, some of the, the statistics and facts um, that I had researched at the time a few years ago, I don't necessarily have all the best details at my fingertips. Um, and please bear with me because I am going to be reading some notes from an iPad screen. Um, because my printer wasn't working, um, so I may be scrolling up and down a bit. Uh, so I will start off by saying that in Canada, at, uh, right now at the border, um, anything outside of your person can be searched by a CBSA officer, a Canadian Border Services officer, without any kind of suspicion. And that's the kind of thing that lawyers and courts call suspicionless searches. Um, so if you think about if you're, you know, old enough, um, you can remember crossing the border prior to having digital devices and, and internet connections. And we always knew um, that our trunks might get searched. If we had a purse, our pur purse could get searched. Our wallets can be searched. Um, however, there is a, a legal threshold for searching a person. Um, but short of having a strip search or getting your body cavity searched right now, um, it's except for in Alberta um, and Ontario, um, there's complete discretion of the Canadian Border Services Agency to search absolutely anything. Um, and, and what that means then with uh, electronic devices is that it is treated as if it's um, a suitcase full of files in your trunk which is pretty risky and um, counterintuitive when you think about how much information we have on our cell phones. Um, we can have our medical records, we can have legal information, we can have very personal uh, photos and videos. And all of that is uh, open to examination right now at the border. So obviously, civil liberties organizations like ourselves and other advocates, especially those that are really concerned with uh, racial profiling and human rights, um, a lot of us have been advocating to have a better threshold or any kind of legal threshold at the border. Um, we've also been advocating to have a, uh, an independent third party oversight agency for the Canadian Border Services Agency, because when you see um, how wide their authorities and legal powers are at the border, um, 
you can only then imagine how difficult it is when they make a mistake, how, how difficult it is to hold them accountable. Um, so let's say even when they were, let's say that they wanted to detain um, your cell phone, you would have to appeal to them, the, the exact same people that took your cell phone. Um, and with all law enforcement agencies, um, the best practices are to have a third party civilian agency. Um, now, I will speak to that as well, because there's another exciting potential change also happening um, in Ottawa with some of the bills that uh, the government has introduced, but they are not yet finalized. So, um, I'll just mention too that the policy right now of the CBSA is that they can ask anybody for their passwords to search their digital devices. And if people don't provide their passwords, um, you well, one real risk is that um, it will likely be seized or detained um, and that you might not see it for months on end. And again, you would have to appeal to the very agency that detained it to try to get it back. Uh, so I imagine that's going to be very difficult. You might just have to get yourself a new device. Um, and uh, the the other thing about it um, is that they can find a lot of um, really intimate information about you, and not just about you, but also about your relationships, even about your work relationships. Um, Lawyers like myself and either do and even doctors um, have had to um, take uh, exceptional. Um, uh, we've had to do exceptional things even to to protect the data of our clients and our patients at the border, um, which you know is a really uh, just fundamentally unacceptable thing to be happening um, in a liberal democracy like Canada, where we have a charter of rights and freedoms. Um, now, the thing about a law enforcement agency that's able to see this kind of stuff in our phones um, and our laptops and our iPads um, without having any kind of reasonable suspicion that you've even done anything, um, and again, that might even potentially arrest you if you fail to share your password with them, um, is that this information can be retained for a very, very long time by the agency. And it's not just the retention of the information that's concerning to us, but it's the sharing of that information and how it can be used by other agencies within Canada, but also with our foreign partners abroad. So, for instance, um, it's very hard to figure out what's happening inside the Canadian Border Services Agency. A lot of times it's through media investigations and court cases, um, sometimes through leaks even, and through access to information. Um, requests that are made. Um, but one of the few places that we can look to is the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. And in 2017, they did an investigation into who the CBSA was sharing people's information with of all the agencies in Canada. And they found that um, like basically almost all the information was being sent um, under one of the laws of Canada, one of our Security of Canada Information Disclosure Act, um, it was being sent exclusively to our spy agency known as CSIS. Now from CSIS, we have absolutely no idea where it goes, but we can imagine into the hands of foreign partners and we've been calling for a long time for audits into these um, international agreements. And we also know then when this information flows about ourselves and our loved ones, potentially our clients, our students and our patients, if this can get into the hands of foreign folks, um, obviously, that presents a risk to people when they want to cross other borders as well, if they want to maybe um, travel somewhere in the future. Um, or even uh, practice their career, they might face barriers because of information that's been shared by our government. So um, it sounds like quite a nightmare, and it actually is a real nightmare from the perspective of human rights and civil liberties. Um, we know, ask, you know, anybody who doesn't look like me, particularly um, people with brown skin, and they will tell you there is so much racial profiling that goes on. And to hear from the CBSA that it's just random searches that are being conducted at the border um, 
is, is really disingenuous. So now for the good news, um, some of these people who have faced racial profiling um, and whose loved ones and friends and just members of the public, they are now in our Senate. And our government has introduced a bill in the Senate to amend the Customs Act. You know why? Because the Alberta Court of Appeal just last year declared that that part of the Customs Act that treats your phone as if it's luggage is actually unconstitutional. It's against Section 8. Um, it's, it's an unreasonable invasion of our privacy. They gave the government one year to fix this. So this is why there's a different standard right now in Alberta and Ontario, and they're trying to make a consistent new standard through the Senate. Well, I am so happy to say that the Senate rejected um, having uh, a very weak and novel uh, legal threshold that had been prepared, uh, proposed by the government in the Senate. And what they've done instead, after studying it at a committee and us showing up uh, alongside many other advocates um, at the Senate committee, is that they've now put a reasonable suspicion threshold into a bill that's going to amend the Customs Act. So fingers crossed, this bill, it, it's one that's now got to go to the House of Commons. This is very unique. Usually government bills start in the House of Commons, then go to the Senate. But in this case, it's going to go the other way around. So we're going to be watching this and monitoring it. And, and we really hope that the House of Commons um, endorses um, this much more acceptable approach to uh, privacy rights um, and just human rights in general at the border. Uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you as always for your insights and your work at the Senate committee. Um, I'd like now to pivot to some the question and answer portion of our panel discussion. The way it's gonna work is that first I have some questions to start us off, and then we'll be opening the floor to questions from our audience through the YouTube's chat function. So I'd like to direct the first question to either Megan or Mara. I was wondering if you could speak about the differences between the powers the police have to search our cell phones versus the power that border agents have to search our cell phones. I can jump in to start. Um, so one of the things that I talked about off the top is that highly contextual nature of the Section 8 right to be protected against unreasonable search and seizure. So the same way that we looked at how um, school administrators, for example, like a principal, have broader powers of search and seizure than the police, you can do the same thing, but with the border and the police. So the courts have essentially decided historically that because of the state's interest, exceptional interest in preventing the entry of undesirable persons, they say, and prohibited goods, that the border agents and the CBSA have greater powers of search and seizure because they have a greater duty of protection, long story short. So same thing as that competing interest between principals and protecting the school body, it's border agents and protecting the nation is how it's been historically interpreted. And police don't share those powers. I imagine in part because perhaps the courts are looking at it as though the border agencies, while their powers are really broad, they're geographically limited to the border versus the police. If they had those same enormous powers of search and seizure, they would have that power across everyone 24 seven, anywhere you were. So it's just a very broad power. So this, that's the way the court kind of tends to think about things, applying those factors to arrive at that conclusion. I don't know, Megan, if you want to hop in and add anything. I guess I could just hop in to add that um, do, that we're happy that finally, um, a, oh, oh gosh, I'm sorry. This is the problem of working from home and I have dogs <laughs> and it's evening. We love dogs. All right, great. <laughs> and dogs also love privacy sometimes, although they have different senses than we do. Um, <laughs> all right, is, is, is that, that, you know, advocates for privacy are really grateful, you know, that courts have finally weighed in and struck down that, that part of the Customs Act as being unconstitutional. Um, now, of course, we, uh, 
you know, when we, when we saw them defer to the government and, and give them some time, and then we saw the government respond by trying to kind of bake in the existing CBSA policy, it was uh, disconcerting. And, and, you know, we kind of may, maybe our courts should have um, read into the law um, what the legal threshold should be. Um, but it, it's so lovely to know that, that these privacy rights and um, the right to be free from discrimination really resonates with the senators and, and that they're trying their best to protect us. So um, we're really hoping um, that this suspicionless search threshold, which is, re it's so wide, there's absolutely nothing at all limiting the discretion right now of CBSA officers. Um, we also know that there are systems being used, there's software, and there are algorithms sometimes that can be used to flag people for secondary expense, uh, uh, secondary examinations, which then can get them into further trouble. Um, like all of these kind of things, and oh, oh, and also RCMP databases are used for flagging, and and we know that the CBSA also uses a lists of of people to search from the USA, which of course we have no control or scrutiny over. Um, you know, it's it's just it's about time that courts got more involved and said no, this is not okay. And it's time to modernize our, our laws and keep up with our digital technology. So we, we just really hope um, that the government doesn't give up this really good opportunity right now and strengthen that threshold to at least make sure that we, because when we say um, um, that uh, reasonable suspicion, I'm sorry, that's the one that the Senate has asked for, that of all the legal thresholds, that is actually the lowest one. So we're only asking for the bare minimum. So that's what I hope it'll be very soon. But right now it's wide open. You're very, very vulnerable at the border. And if you want to protect yourself, absolutely, you don't even bring a digital device. Yeah, thank you so much, Megan, for flagging the way our privacy ends up getting shared in ways we don't really consider when, when it's first being searched at the border. Um, I'm optimistic about the Senate bill though, so fingers crossed. Um, my next question is for Spencer or Jessica. My question is, freedom of expression and privacy are often seen as opposing issues, but in your experience, what are the intersections between these civil liberties, and what are the most, mis the most common misconceptions that you've come across about how these issues pertain to youth? Uh, I, can, I can start, and Jessica, you can add on if you want. Uh, uh, I, think, I think to answer that question, I mean, I think privacy is a lot more of a, um, uh, I, I think it's more of an abstract term um, than, than freedom of expression, because uh, privacy can mean a lot of different things in, in depending on the context. It can bodily autonomy, uh, privacy and association, um, uh, data privacy. It can mean a lot of different things. Um, but you know, I think generally, I think, you know, the way I, I choose to understand it is it's the right to be let alone. Um, looking at the Louis Brandeis uh, article from 1890. Um, freedom of expression, um, I think, comes across a lot more clearly as it just generally refers to the ability to communicate something without uh, interference. Uh, and I think that's, that's the main point across all contexts. Um, I think a mi misconception with, with youth and privacy is that, um, number one, they, they tend to think of it in terms of um, internet service providers and social media, um, and only within that context, the data privacy and how it relates to their interaction with that platform. And then uh, if, if, it, if, if an issue of privacy arises, generally the arguments are, it's, well, I have nothing to hide, therefore uh, privacy doesn't matter to me. Um, and I think uh, across all areas of privacy, right, data privacy or, uh, or, or personal privacy, privacy of property, um, is that every, having something to hide is, 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 not, is not an act of suspicion or is not, uh, is not something to to invite further scrutiny. Everyone has something to withhold uh, that they don't want to share with other people for various reasons. Um, that that's very basic human nature, uh, and 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 at times that can conflict with freedom of expression, which uh, even more abstract. One can think of you know freedom of expression as uh, uh, requiring no barriers and no walls to be able to disseminate information versus privacy is like, you know, the requirement to have walls and boundaries to disseminate information. And it, those, those can conflict at times. 
And at other times, um, they do intersect. And I, I think in our experience as student journalists, where privacy is a prerequisite to engage in expressive activity, uh, where it is necessary for uh, our purposes as student media and to be able to exercise our rights under Section 2B of the Charter, um, that our Section 8 rights uh, to protect against unreasonable search and seizure, specifically of uh, you know, uh, you know, our interview notes, our notes with sources, uh, our confidential sources, uh, and other information like that, uh, that needs to be free uh, of, uh, of uh, interference and surveillance uh, and needs to be let alone. Uh, so, that, so, so, so privacy and freedom of expression can advance in tandem. Um, and, and so at times I think, uh, yes, they absolutely conflict and others. Um, and I think especially in the case of uh, media broadly, uh, they, they enhance each other where privacy is a necessary uh, element of uh, achieving freedom of, exp uh, freedom of the press uh, and fully freedom of expression. Uh, and the Griffin Justice is one example of that. And the cases that Jessica mentioned earlier, R versus the National Post, R versus, the, uh, or Saving Sailor versus Massard, uh, those are RV Vice, those are all examples uh, of that. Uh, but yeah, that's, I think that, that's how I would, I would summarize that. Jessica, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I, I think Spencer covered it. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Spencer, for that, and especially for flagging how important it is to be able to maintain the privacy of your sources um, and to be able to do the work that you do. Um, so my last question is for anyone, any of the panelists. What avenues of resistance have you come across in your work? And what can people do when they feel that their privacy rights or their freedom of expression rights are being infringed upon? Big question, I don't know who wants to go first. I can hop in. I think that Megan covered a bit of it in her remarks just about right now, kind of how it stands in terms of um, the, for example, with the RCMP, you would be making a complaint to the very body that breached your privacy rights. So you'd be making a complaint to the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission, um, which is an oversight body, but still in the whole matrix of the RCMP. Um, and failing that, if you're making a complaint to the individual body, say the VPD, RCMP, as I mentioned, um, if those, if you're not satisfied with the outcome, then you can go to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, as Megan said. But one of the really big problems with all of these is that they just fundamentally lack any teeth and any ability to do anything about it. Um, not to be a downer, but that is the present thing and why we're advocating so hard for change in this regard. There is currently a bill that has been introduced that's introducing a new oversight body for the RCMP and for the first time an oversight body for the CBSA um, that will provide a complaints mechanism in a critical area of privacy breaches, as we talked about at the border. But of course, again, we're not very optimistic about that bill at present. Um, and whether or not it'll actually lead to any substantive change is yet to be seen. But those are some of the avenues, for example, that you can consider um, for now. But I invite everyone else to jump in and raise the morale on this question, if possible. Well, I think what a lot of people are doing, because the state really isn't hasn't protected us well with their laws and the recourse mechanisms is that you see people using uh, technologies, um, kind of like encryption type stuff, and having to just be careful, right, and modify your behavior. Um, you know, it, it's at th this point in time, having access to the internet and having your personal device is so important in so many ways, that, and it's so inconvenient, right, to, to have to leave it behind. So um, I don't, I don't know, the until we get better, uh, until the government comes out to protect us better from these kind of surveillance mechanisms, I, I think all we can do is just work together with our communities and help one another to understand what's the, the latest and greatest technologies and what's the best kind of personal um, privacy hygiene that we can do on our electronic devices when we're around these figures of authority that haven't been properly reined in yet. Yeah, for sure. I'll just also jump in. Um, especially for 
younger people like Spencer and myself um, who maybe aren't necessarily prepared to take something to the privacy commissioner or aren't, aren't too sure of their privacy rights. I think kind of asking yourself some questions to, to grasp, grasp the situation a little bit better. Um, and I would say kind of the first one being, you know, what preceded this alleged privacy infringement? Like what, what kind of led up to this? And then um, what act, actions or action or actions um, are, you know, violating my privacy rights? And, and third being, is there a good reason or, or is it reasonable that my privacy is being violated in these situations? Um, and, and certainly the most important uh, determination being C, I think, um, um, just to, to better situate um, yourself as a young person, or, or even if you aren't young, <laughs> um, just just um, in order to grasp uh, the privacy violation a little bit better and then, and then you know, figure out your next steps from there. I, th I, think, I think that what Jessica mentioned there is, is uh, applicable to all, uh, all situations uh, of, of privacy. Because I, I mentioned earlier that um, privacy is a very contextual thing. Uh, it can mean data privacy. Uh, it, it can be in, in examples we were discussing earlier, it can be the media's rights of privacy. It can be uh, your right to privacy, not to have a principle without reason, search your phone. Uh, and all, those are all questions that are applicable in each one of those examples is, is it necessary for you to submit your personal information uh, to this website? Uh, or is it, is, 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 does this application uh, uh, need to be viewed by your principal? Uh, and, and does this in person have a re good reason to do so? And how are they considering your privacy? I think those are all, those are questions that apply to all uh, all all contexts of privacy, even though it is a very expansive um, expansive space, I think that those those are those three items are very uh, good places to start. To start, especially if you are in a situation where uh, you're you're prepared to take something to the privacy commissioner, or you're, when you're prepared to follow a strictly legal route. Um, that is the I think that's one that we've used in our own experience to inquire with school officials um, uh, at in a more informal way uh, to investigate. Uh, you know, our, our holistic privacy uh, experience and rights. All right, thank you so much for all of your thoughts on this matter. Um, so I'd like now to open up the floor to questions from the public. So if you have any questions for the panelists, um, please put them in the live stream chat function now and um, I will pass them along. So we already have a question that's come in and the question is from Megan. Uh, Megan, the question is, can border service agents search cloud data at the border as well? All right. Uh, although the law doesn't say one way or the other, what the CBSA says on its website um, and what they were telling the Senate um, when they presented uh, to promote this new proposed law in front of them was that their policy is to always uh, put it on airplane mode uh, prior to a search. Now, again, that's not a legal requirement. So we really don't know how often they're doing that. And also, um, as some of you may know, that you can still access the cloud when you're on airplane mode if you're connected to an, a network, right? So. Um, We'll just have to, I guess, take their word for it that that's their policy. Again, if they violate their own policy, there, there's not much anyone could do. Um, if anybody is aware of a search like this, um, that it's happened to them or anybody they know, we would be very interested to find out more and understand the context. Um, but yeah, that's the official policy. And again, um, we, we don't know of an in instance where... Um, they have connected it and searched more um, because that person would probably, they would have to challenge it in a court of law for us to know, for this to become transparent and knowable to the public. Um, it's really, really difficult um, without having proper oversight bodies and having really good access to information laws and privacy laws. It's really, really difficult to peer behind the scene and, and to see if they're really doing what they, what they say they're doing. But, you know, um, presuming that that is true, um, it, it's, 
it's good to know. It's really, really good to know. I mean, we definitely recommend um, that you put it on airplane mode before you even get to the customs. Um, but uh, again, um, what's really concerning is um, once your electronic device is removed from your view, even if it's taken into a back room or if it's detained or seized um, for months on end, there's some really good software that law enforcement agencies have at this time to break encryption. Um, and then we, uh, in theory, they could take an entire clone, like clone all the data and have your entire hard drive with all of your personal communications and they could keep that and you would never ever know even if they return the phone to you um yeah so so again it's excellent that our courts are starting to weigh in and say that there need to be some kind of limitations on this stuff because it's just it's it's so um it's it's just so bizarre that it's taken this long um, since the internet and our software devices um, for the law and policy to catch up with it. Um, and again, it's not just changing the Customs Act. We need to change so much. Um, when I was, uh, there were all these people recording me when I went up to, to visit Tiny House Warriors just less than a year ago. Um, there is a, a protest camp um, near the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And there were people recording me that I was pretty sure were private security, um, working for a Crown Corporation. Um, and when I asked them about it, they wouldn't tell me what they were doing. So I'm lucky I'm a lawyer. I know about the Privacy Act. So I, I filed a request under the Privacy Act and sent it to Trans Mountain. And um, the response I got is, we can't tell you if we have your information either way, but even if we did have it, we would withhold it. And then they, they like the exceptions in the law are just so wide. They say that it could inhibit a, lot, a legal investigation. So, you know, good luck to anybody trying to find out why you're being spied on. Um, Cause you know, so it's not just the customs act. It's like, it's a whole constellation of laws that really need, um, to be reformed and updated um, to better protect everybody it, for everywhere from our classrooms to our borders and beyond. Yeah, thank you so much for that less than reassuring answer, but um, you know, an important discussion for sure. Um, our next question is for Jessica and Spencer. And the question is, what kind of advice do you have for other student press groups who are navigating their relationship with their respective school board or school administrator? Jessica, do you want to go so first? Do you want to or start? Do you want me? Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> go start, uh, go start. I, I know you have your own advice, so I'll just give one element of mine. Because um, uh, Jessica and I have very different, um, I mean, we have a lot, we have a lot of advice uh, to give, but I think if I had to give one, um, specific to my role. Um, I was editor-in-chief uh, and uh, I, I, was, I was present for a lot of very interesting and magical interpretations of the law uh, and uh, from school officials um, over a period of two years uh, and some very interesting rationale. Um, and my takeaway from that is um, in every, in every uh, sitting and discussion, uh, I was there as a journalist, and my only aim was to make my community better and practice journalism in the public interest. Uh, and I knew that was my goal, and I knew I that that's what I that's what I was doing. Uh, and what I got out of knowing that and having to to have have discussions and conversations and face school officials from uh, a vice principal all the way up to the deputy superintendent. Uh, and, and the chair of the Vancouver School Board uh, is a healthy disrespect for authority uh, at times uh, is a very useful, uh, useful thing. And it is very difficult. And I uh, do acknowledge that I'm in a very privileged position to say that uh, as a white male. Um, and and uh, I, not, not everyone has that, that ability that I do to disregard so easily uh, authority. Um, however, um, uh, the the recognizing that, that school officials authority is not absolute and, uh, and especially in public schools where they are bound by the charter of rights and freedoms 
uh, they, they, they are still beholden to that uh, at, a, at a much higher degree than they are to the school act and their statutory authority. Um, and sometimes they just need to be reminded of that. Uh, and sometimes more assertively than others, but that would be my advice. And I'll just tack on to Spencer um, here. I think that it's really, really easy um, for student journalists, and at least in my experience, to feel kind of like a little bit isolated, like your own in your own little bubble within your school district. Um, and I think um, it's it's really important to keep in mind um, that there are other people, you know, fighting for the same things you're fighting for, whether it be um, civil liberties groups or or it's another student paper, but they're you know across the country. And I think knowing that and being confident in your journalism in your ethics in your um, good work uh, with that, just being able to write the story and produce um, your journalism, regardless of, you know, times where you feel less than confident because a school administrator is telling you like, hey, you're in the wrong here. Um, I, can I just ask one follow up about that? So I know that you reached out. One of the things you guys did to, you know, assist um, yourselves was to reach out to the BCCLA, to the CAJ, to the Student Press Freedom Center in the States. Can you just talk a little bit about that experience that I think is sometimes uh, really helpful for young people to know that you have always the capacity to reach out for advocates. There are advocates who can help you with this. Absolutely. I think that uh, the... The first, the first time that we ever um, uh, in, in sought outside assistance uh, was, uh, I think, in February 2021, when I sent an email to Megan out of the blue, uh, <laughs> just asking if the BCCLA would be available. Um, and we eventually cold email. Their assistance. Yes, the cold email. Uh, uh, and, uh, and Jessica and I eventually tried to go down to the office in May of 2021, uh, which was an interesting experience. But... Are, but absolutely, um, public interest uh, legal aid organizations are, uh, were, are essential in our ability to, to get where we are today, um, not only in, in, in obviously drafting the act and, and doing all of that advocacy work, but uh, the, the core functioning of our paper is absolutely supported by uh, civil liberties organizations like the BCCLA. Uh, there are several across Canada uh, that, that are able to assist, especially now when uh, you know, humbly, Jessica and I have been able to elevate national awareness about this issue. Um, uh, the Student Press Law Center in the United States, uh, they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, there is no Canadian equivalence fully to them. Uh, so there's a lot of organizations that have stepped up in the last year uh, to be available for obviously the Griffin's Nest when we've needed them. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm sure going forward, uh, a lots of other student media should they should they be needed. But yes, absolutely. Uh, I, it, we're, you know, Jessica and I are always available to help other student journalists, and initially we're able we're able to point them in the right direction, uh, as that's how we ended up with some other uh, other connections as well that were able to help us out too. Yeah, and I'll also just add, um, sorry, Spencer, I hope I'm not interrupting you, but um, one of the most important skills I would say is knowing when you can't do something, and I think you know, in our case, we knew we recognized, you know, we need you know, outside assistance. We can't figure this out completely on our own as, as people who obviously don't have formal legal training. We were only, what, 17, 16 at the time. Um, so, so recognizing and, and not being, you know, ashamed or worried of like, what's going to happen. I think recognizing that you need that help and, and doing what it takes to get that there is, is a very important skill. Amazing. Thanks so much for talking about that as well. So we have one last question um, from the public chat, and it is for Megan once again. Um, has there been any response from Canada Border Service? Sorry, has there been any response from the Canadian Border Services Agency or from CSIS to the request for audits about their information sharing? What a good question. Um, not that I know of. And uh, hmm, I think if I would have to look anywhere for it, in, in 2017, there was a House of Commons committee. There's a Privacy and Ethics Committee. It's a standing committee in the House of Commons in Ottawa, and it's, 
it's made up of members of all the parties. And they were tasked with looking at privacy at the Canada-US border at that time. And I think if anything, I would need to look back at some of the testimonies um, before their committee um, and also to see about the recommendations that came out of it as well. That committee um, actually recommended um, that the search threshold be changed and, and increased from nothing to something. Um, and which is pretty ironic given that then the government introduced a bill with a lower threshold. But anyhow, I'm thinking that maybe we could look back and see if there was a recommendation to, to audit those agreements, but I highly doubt it because we'd probably be um, uh, monitoring that and looking out for it too. Um, our national security agencies and our law enforcement agencies are largely you know, like there's not much public scrutiny. If there is some scrutiny of them, it's all behind closed doors. So it's it's hard to find out. And it's why we keep pushing for more oversight and transparency. Um, I, I would think that these um, security agencies and law enforcement agencies would resist these types of audits. But again, I think that, you know, they're, we need to have them. They're good. They're good for building trust. Um, so no, I'm sorry. I, I think we, we've been screaming into the abyss so far. Um, but again, uh, maybe, maybe we could get um, some more actions. There's, there's also, uh, uh, our government is looking around um, uh, private privacy rights around, they're implementing a digital charter, which is basically updating privacy rights that apply that, sorry, that, um, that relate to between us and companies and private companies. Um, so I don't know, I'm thinking maybe part of that dialogue asking more about that, because as we get more and more digital, um, we start to see, especially during this pandemic, right, we saw um, just recently, we found out that the government, I think, had bought a bunch of uh, location data to figure out um, from our internet service providers in a way that wasn't really legal. Um, so we see more and more partnerships between our, our agencies, our law enforcement and security agencies and third parties. And that's another big issue when it comes to privacy rights and untangling who has a right to what. Um, so maybe we could try to get it more through the updates to, to the privacy law laws that are also going on. But um, again, I'm I'm a bit skeptical, but we'll we'll keep pushing for it. And if anybody in the audience is aware of anybody else calling for this kind of audit, or if an audit's been done in any of the other countries that we tend to work a lot with when it comes to foreign intelligence stuff, um, particularly the UK, Australia, New Zealand, or the United States, um, or France, um, if they've done an audit, then we could probably find out as well about what Canada is doing. That's a, that's another way to peek behind the curtains. Um, so thanks for that excellent question. Yeah, thank you so much, Megan, for talking about the way our data gets shuffled around from the private to the public sphere. It's so important to have that conversation. Um, unfortunately, though, we can have run out of time. So before you wrap up, I just want to say one last big thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their knowledge and their insights with us tonight. And I'd also like to put a huge thank you to all the staff at the BCCLA who are working behind the scenes to put tonight's panel together, as well as, again, a thank you to CIRA and the Law Foundation of Ontario for making this event possible. Lastly, I'd like to thank you all for joining us here and committing your time to learning more about privacy rights and freedom of expression rights in Canada. Tonight's panel will be live on, the, on our YouTube channel at the BCCLA. If you found it enlightening, we would encourage you to share it with your friends or your family. Please feel free to follow the BCCLA on Twitter, on Facebook, or to sign up for our email list where you can stay informed about all our programming and all the work that we're doing. All of the information can be found at bccla.org. Thank you so much and have a good night. Did you know that in Canada, school administrators may be legally authorized to search their students' electronic devices, including cell phones, through their code of conduct? That means your high school principal has the right to confiscate your device if they think the necessary factors have been met. You might be thinking, 
I keep a lot of important personal information on my phone. Aren't people expected to have a reasonable amount of security and privacy in this country? Well, you're right. Sort of. In Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it states that everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure. But the Charter also allows those rights to be limited within reason. This means a high school principal has even more authority over searching students than a police officer. Learn more about your privacy and what you can do to keep your electronic devices safe at bccla.org slash edevices.